It's the reason why the good Lord invented the Internet. It is the Mike Sasson Show broadcasting from Mr. Small Studio in beautiful Millvale, Pennsylvania on a beautiful fall day here in beautiful Millvale, Pennsylvania. Perfect 72 degrees and sunny, low humidity. It was a wonderful day, and I'm looking forward to more beautiful days because every day in Millvale is a beautiful day. It is the Mike Sasson Show. Thank you very much for listening to The River's Edge at www.riversedgepgh.com where you get the best local music and the best talk on the planet earth again with me as always is the greatest producer the most influential producer in the history of internet radio a first ballot internet radio hall of famer if you ever want to visit the internet radio hall of fame it is currently outside of a sunoco in el paso texas make sure to bring plenty of money get something for grandma it is the alex clemens how are you doing the alex clemens i'm Dude, great. There you go. All good stuff. We're here. Great show today. Jam-packed. We're going to be talking about uh, PodCon, where I was on a great uh, a great uh, panel, an intellectual discussion uh, surrounding International Podcast Day. Also, we're going to be talking about some giveaways that we have, uh, some great festivals that are coming on. Also, we're going to be talking to Derek Minto, a personal friend of mine and a huge member of the Pittsburgh comedy community. He hosts every Thursday the best open mic in the city of Pittsburgh and one of the best open mics I've ever been to across the country at Hambones. And because of that and because of other things, uh, help with uh, John Winters with the uh, Burning Bridges Festival, there is now going to be the Burning Bridges Comedy uh, Club at Hambones right in Lawrenceville. So in the weekend, if you sit there and say, I want to get uh, a ticket to watch an amazing stand-up comic from around the country, guys that have been on television, guys that have uh, you know performed with huge names, you don't have to go anywhere but Lawrenceville and go down there, pay like I think it's five or ten bucks, Whoa. sit there. Yeah, it's it's so inexpensive. You should be showing up there with a ski mask. That's how much uh, of a deal this is, and you're going get to wa- get to watch top-notch comedy. So thank you to that. Again, you are listening to The Mike Sasson Show. You might be listening to us on The River's Edge at www.riversedgepgh.com or on TuneIn Radio, or you might be listening to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, or Google Play, or on the TuneIn Radio app across the planet Earth, or you might be listening to us on Facebook Live. Thank you very much for everyone that watches us on Facebook Live. And remember to comment on Facebook Live, and at the end of the show, we will respond to your comments if you're watching live on Monday night when we do record. Um, Again, thank you very much to everyone that supports the show. And because we want to thank everyone who supports the show, we want to thank people and how we support them. Like, for instance, uh, this Saturday in the Allentown Business District, Allentown right above uh, the uh, south side, Right above uh, the, uh, it's between like the south side and like it's right up from the, uh, from the uh, the station square. There is going to be the La Creme Music Festival. It's this Saturday, starting at one all the way until the rockin' stops. It's going to be an incredible time. La Creme. Everyone, La Creme. I believe that's how they pronounce it. Okay. L e c r e m e. How would you pronounce it? Why is it called that? I don't you know. know. They didn't mention that in the poster. Anyways, or you can possibly... See, here's the thing. When you listen to the Mike Sasson Show, you are listening to uh, something that we're like a gang. We're like a group, and we're trying to... You're trying to adjust your microphone. I'm really def- trying to make you hear me. Uh... I can hear you. I can hear you very well. That's why the I can hear every... Yeah, yeah, I got it. Cool. We good? I got it. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, But, you know, it's important to adjust yourself. It's just like with a guy. And, you know, sometimes we we make fun of a guy because he just tries to constantly adjust himself. Well, sometimes in podcasting and internet radio, you got to adjust yourself. And sometimes you make a little noise. That's how it works. Sure. But that's how it works. Um, But because you know us, which makes you one of the cool kids, here's what you get. Um, next weekend kicks off Pittsburgh Libation Week. Now, what's libation? Talking wine, talking beer, talking mead, talking the stuff that just makes life worth living, the stuff that just all the good things in life. Well, if you want to go to the kickoff bash, which is going to be at Nova Place on the north side, a, a beautiful facility. I've been there myself. It's an incredible facility. They've already hosted some great festivals there already. But on Friday, October 12th from 6 to 10 p.m., they're going to have the kickoff bash for Libation Week. And you're sitting there saying, Mike, 
how do I get one of these tickets? Well, you go there, you find it on the Facebook, you find it on internet, and then when you go to check out, you see, hey, do I have any discounts? Hell yeah, you do. You put in <laughs> Sasson, my last name, S-A-S-S-O-N, and you get five bucks off five one, of the v- bucks. one of the VIP packages. So it's an incredible uh, thing that you're going to make sure you take advantage of. So it's going to be a wonderful time. So take care of that. Again, just plug in Sasson for the Pittsburgh Libation Week. Uh, it's going to be incredible starting There's so much on- alcohol. Yeah, I mean, it's. I'll be honest with you, if, with, with the five bucks off, it's going to cost you like 55 bucks, 60 bucks. Yeah. But... I think you're going to get some high quality alcohol and you prove to a date of yours that you're not a low run scumbag. There's literally like every single one of my favorite breweries there. Every single one. I think Alex has already talked is that maybe she might show up there. Maybe you might get, might, might get to meet the great Alex Clemens. So thank you very much to all of them. Again, so support to uh, this Saturday and the Allentown Business District for the La Creme Music Festival. Or, again, the week after that, Friday, October 12th, where you get to support your liver by drinking heavily at the Pittsburgh Libation Kickoff Bash at Nova Place. And, again, if you want five bucks off, you just put in Sasson and you get the five bucks off. I already tried it. It it works. Oh, oh, good. Yeah, I didn't didn't want to say something and then everyone going, what are you talking about? No, you do it. You put in a discount, (laughs) S-A-S-S-O-N, and you get the five bucks off. legit. We didn't just talk to you about it for a couple minutes for nothing. Yeah. Well, by the way, uh, talking about something we said on the show last week that didn't turn out to be true, this past Sunday I was at Pittsburgh PodCon where I was uh, on a panel at the Spirit Lounge in Lawrenceville. Oh, no. Did they not have pizza? The kitchen was closed on Sunday. I told you. I told you if you hyped it up too much, they wouldn't have it. Well, I, you encouraged me. You should have been like, Mike, cool it with the pizza talk. Now, there was – there was – you weren't you weren't forceful enough. Anyways, so they had, a, they had a truck outside for food, so it wasn't like the people were starving. Oh, good, good. But they didn't have pizza. But it was great food. And like everything else associated with the River's Edge, Brian Crawford, the godfather, put this on – And what was incredible about it was the simple fact of the matter is, just like the Millville Music Festival, just like Millville Days, just like everything that the River's Edge is a part of, knocked it out of the park. I've said this to Brian directly. If he ever wants to just forget the whole internet radio thing and just be an event planner, he'd become an insane zillionaire. He'd be like astronaut level rich. Yeah. That's how good he is. Because when you – I was really not – I honestly didn't even understand what the heck this was. (laughs) And when I showed up, it was kind of like a college fair with, like, desks. But at each, each desk was an individual podcast, yeah, which was incredible. And then for an hour with The Godfather uh, talking to all of us, I was able to be on stage with some great podcasters talking about the, – the big question was, why do you podcast? Why do you podcast? Why do I – and it came down to me. I was just like uh, – so more people come to my shows. So and, I can yeah. talk about boobs and things. Yeah, boobs uh, and things is and pretty much. And people hear it. Well, but it, it's, I brought up something which was interesting in talking to a lot of other people that are in podcasting and internet radio. We are unique in terms of the fact of we have no theme. No, yeah, we, no. A lot of people are like, <laughs> oh, we're a show that talks about pro wrestling or we're a show that talks about horror movies or we're a show that talks about, you know, uh, you know, Pittsburgh sports. Yeah. How would you describe this show in that frame? I always describe it as more of like a kind of like a late night talk show. Like that's it's not a morning how, show. Yeah, that's yeah. typically how I, I explain it to people because they're like, oh, what's it on? And I'm like. You know, it's more of like a late night talk show. Mike says he's a comedian. Yeah. And you know, I claim to be a comedian, yeah. and each week I'm proven wrong. And yeah. I, I, I sit there and pretend that. And, you know, we have segments just like, you know, a late night talk show would. Sometimes we interview people about random stuff. So, it, you know, that's basically what it is, just in podcast form. Yes. So really what we should be should be late night with Mike Sasson. Late night with Mike Sasson. Even though that Because we are technically we record late night now. Yeah. You know, even if it's not necessarily, you know, streaming. Well, that was always one of the big shocks when you first learn that the late night talk shows were typically recorded at like four or five in the afternoon. Yeah. That was one of the things but the weird thing was they would have a clock in their studio. 
as if it was 11.30 Eastern time. Just to trick people well, just into, so that like, they, drinking and saying weirder things. Yeah, but, I mean, they would always record. Like, it, it was always weird because when Letterman would go out on the streets of New York City, it'd be light outside. Right, yeah. Because, again, he's recording it at, like, 4 or 5 in the afternoon. Yeah. And what was always weirder is, like, then Jay Leno would do the same thing. He would record at 4 or 5 in the afternoon. But because of the fact that it's on the West Coast, it would actually be more like 8 or 9 that they would be recording. So they had a little bit less leeway to, like, think of stuff. Right. So, I mean, like, sometimes, like again, they do, quote, unquote, edit things out if something, like, if someone swears or something like that. But that was one of the things that was weird about, let's say, for instance, Saturday Night Live more recently, especially when they got to be more topical. They used to, they would, you know, again, would be live on the East Coast, but it, they couldn't put it live because it would be like 8.30 in the, uh, in the evening on the West Coast. Right, right. But more recently, they actually started to do it live on – coast to coast really so yeah you would see it on the in the in la kind of like 8 30 9 o'clock i didn't know that yeah apparently again it was just a little and what they would do is they would show it once and then they would have like and then during the gap they would show like late night news or they'd have like a half hour like you know rerun of something else and then at 11 30 they'd show it again for the people that would mm. you know that would that would thinking that it was on at that time right actually won at late night yeah but with, and then the other thing that was weird is they would always talk about that yeah did it make the west coast because they would be like it would lie it would be live in new york and then the people in the eastern and the central time zones would get it but they could cut something if it really was, like, bad. Oh. So they'd always talk about, like, ooh, this sketch didn't make it to the West Coast type deal. Yeah, that's interesting. I but that's one that. of the cool things about, like, you were talking about podcasting. There was actually one of the people there on the panel who hosted a, uh, a show about B-movies. And he talked about that about 70% of the people who listen to his show, he says, are actually out of the San Francisco Bay Area. That's weird. Yeah, they well, have, like, something with... Yeah. Horror movies, though? I don't know. But it, was, it wasn't it was horror movies. a B movie. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Get it right. Anyway, so one of the other things that I thought was weird is I talked about it, and Brian said, like, yeah, we have had people listen to our show that have been overseas or, you know, or in you know, different parts of the country. And I always thought it was weird. Like, how would someone find this silly little show out of Pittsburgh? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I definitely – I definitely understand that. Well, I don't understand it because, like, I mean, I've listened to podcasts before. Like, I just got done listening to this Australian podcast, but it's like a it's a pretty well known like podcast, and like I don't, probably definitely made its way around Australia. And like, I'm very very late to the game listening to it, but it's like you know a lot of people know about it, so I'm not sure. I yeah. don't know. People, maybe but they people do find are just us. talking. Maybe people are traveling from yeah. Pittsburgh, and then they talk to other people, and they're like, oh, shit, I should check that out. That's how it works. So, again, thank you to everyone who listens across the country and across the world, and to thank you for everybody that I met at the Pittsburgh Punk Con. A lot of people were missing you, Alex. A lot of people were like, hey, where's Alex? I know, and you should say she has – she kind of has another life as no, well. No, I claim that she's crying in in a in a room because she can't make it. Yeah, she well, clearly... I mean, I was, yeah, yeah, but, you know. Yeah, well, that's what happens. But thank you again to everyone there, and especially to the godfather, Brian Crawford, for making all of that happen. Um, another, I just want to tell a nice little story before we move on, which I thought was interesting. It's always weird when someone gets to meet one of their – Idols, someone that they super respect. Yeah, yeah. So um, Alex DePula, who's been on the show, friend of the Mike Sasson show, who has a great podcast on his own. The uh, only other one I listen to. What, what is it called again? Uh, give Me Murder, Give Me Death. Give Me Murder, Give Me Death. A great podcast by uh, Alex DePula. Um, well, he's a huge fan of the movie MacGruber. Yeah. And yeah, like huge, huge. huge like fan. he has a MacGruber tattoo. Yeah. If you've ever seen MacGruber, uh, it's it's a based off a Saturday Night Live sketch where they had this. Uh, they had Will Forte playing a MacGyver type person, but you know how MacGyver would ch- like like fix a like stop a bomb with like a pen and like baking soda and a tampon. Yeah. This time he never did. And he always blew himself up. Yeah. That was the joke. And they made this into a huge movie and it's become a cult classic. Well, the director of that movie, uh, you might know him better from uh, uh, The Lonely Island or from uh, Pop Star. Yeah. Uh, is uh, Yorma Takone. Had no idea that's how you said his name. I hope I'm doing it right. Anyways, <laughs> very nice man and proving that he's a very nice man. His wife 
is currently in Pittsburgh. She is directing the Mr. Rogers <gasps> film Aww. that is starring Tom Hanks, and everybody's a buzz here in Pittsburgh with Tom Hanks sightings. And so the word kind of got around that Alex was a huge fan of MacGruber. And, his, the, you know, again, the person who was with uh, Lonely Island and, her, and, her, and that woman's husband is hanging out because her wife is in Pittsburgh and everything like that. And word got to him somehow that this comedian, Alex DePula, was a huge fan of MacGruber. Yeah. And even Alex put on his Twitter, is like, I, I, I don't want to really meet anybody in the world, but I, if I would really geek out if I saw him because it would just be so cool. So Thursday, again, as we talk about with, uh, we'll talk later with Derek about the Hambones. Hambones, great bar, great food, and again, great comedy. Well, it's Thursday night, the big night for the, uh, the open mic, and Alex is eating tacos at the bar. One of the other comics comes up to him and sits there and goes, hey, your guy is like right over there. And he's just like, no way. <laughs> I've never seen Alex more like like he was just literally nervous. Now this is a guy who gets gets up on stage and talks about like wanting to kill dolphins and having sex with horses. So <laughs> to see that he's like nervous was a little weird and a little touching. Yeah. So he sits there and he's like he stops eating his taco. He sits there and goes, "What? I, I gotta go. I, I gotta go see him. Well, should I see him? Should I let him be? Should I should I just you know because he's having he's having dinner with his wife and friends and blah. Should I go over there? And then someone sits there and says like, "Well, is it even him?" This is where I come in. This is where I try to be the buddy. Yeah. I go, okay, I'll nonchalantly walk by and walk back and tell you if it's him. Because I recognized him from yeah, you know, yeah. Lonely Island and stuff like that. So I go into the, uh, the foyer and pick up a city paper and walk back and look at him and do the – not like meh, like stare at him, but yeah, like yeah. just kind of do the cool little walk by. And I walk right up to Alex and I go, yeah, that's him. And he's just freaking out. And he, like, literally just does, like, he's like, hey, does anybody have any gum? I can't, like, have my breath stink. I can't do whatever, oh. all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and so we stand off from afar, and Alex gets the you know, the nerve to go up to him. And all you see is um, Yorma look at him and smile and open his arms. Oh, oh, my God. Like, and sit there, and they just go, oh, my God. Like, it was just the sweetest moment you'd ever seen in your life because you see someone meeting one of their the people that they admire most in the world who made a piece of art that just really resonated with them to the point he has a tattoo of MacGruber and everything like that. And it was so amazing. To, and they sat there and they literally talked for like 15 minutes. And it was so cool. And, the, and I think, have we shown the picture yet of the two? <laughs> so cute. <laughs> it is so amazing. And at, you just see a truly happy Alex DePula. And I went up to him afterwards, and he was just glowing. And I sit there, and I go, dude, here's your deal. If, you, if you're if you about to die, that was going to be your make-a-wish. You can't. You have no more make-a-wishes. Oh, damn. And he sits there, and he goes, no, I'll just die now. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Now, the cool thing is, like, about maybe 10 minutes later, I'm sitting with Alex, and Alex was in front of me during the, the open mic. He was, like, 12, and I was going to be yeah. 13 in order. And he comes up to Alex and sits there and says, like, hey, um... Hey, I'd love to see your comedy. And Alex is like, hey, I'm, I'm up in a few. And he sits there and goes, I, I'm, I'm here with people, but, you know, I'm definitely going to find you. And I'm like a foot away from it. And I didn't want to sit there and be like, yeah, he likes you from MacGruber, but I like you from Lonely Island, everything like that. So I just kind of played it cool. And I was like, mm, okay, mm, cool. You know, hey, whatever. Nice yeah, meeting you. All yeah. that kind of stuff. But I just wanted to relay that. It's just an incredible story of it's awesome when you meet someone that you admire and they're cool people. Yeah, they don't suck. And they don't suck. Just like when you meet me or Alex, we're not going to suck. I think we're... this is this is almost like the time where I met Alex Sapula for the first time. Yes. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, you went up to him I and was, you said, I'm Alex, excited. you're Alex. I was like real fangirling too. Mm -hmm. And it was a, definitely not the same caliber as yeah. that meeting. Yes. But I I've was, seen I, people fangirl around you. I, I haven't seen that. Oh, so. I had one comedian come up to me and look at me and go, is, is that Alex? And I go, yeah, that's Alex. She goes, I, I, I can't go up to her. <laughs> and I literally just go, it's, it's my, just go up to her, say hi, whatever. And he's like, Alex. She goes, no, that's. She's like super mean. Yeah. Oh, I mean, like again, you're mean to people, and you say, shut up, don't talk to me. Yeah, yeah. Don't look at me. But, but it's, it's you, and so you absolutely deserve it. You deserve to treat people like garbage. That's how I think about it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, again, a great story. Speaking of great stories, we're gonna be back with. Alex's bar thoughts 
and experiences. And after that, it's going to be an interview with Derek Minto where he's going to talk about a brand new comedy experience that you can have in the city of Pittsburgh with the Burning Bridges Comedy Club at Hambones. It's an unbelievable event. We're going to be talking about him and local comedy. And then we're going to do Fresh Eyes with Jimi Hendrix. Then we're going to do news and notes from the world of weirdness and sports. Again, my name is Mike Sasson. You're listening to The River's Edge at www.riversedgepgh.com. We'll be right back. Brian Crawford letting you know that Kevin Slogic, my State Farm agent in Allison Park, is here to help life go right and reminds you that you're listening to The River's Edge Radio Network. You are listening to The Mike Sasson Show on the River's Edge at www.riversedgepgh.com or you are listening to us on the TuneIn radio app across the planet Earth or you're listening to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, or Google Play or you're watching us on Facebook Live. Again, thank you everyone who supports us and you know what? We're giving you as a present an opportunity to drink some great alcohol. That's why next October 12th, the Friday, October 12th from 6 to 10 p.m., it's the kickoff bash of the Pittsburgh Libation Festival. It's going to be amazing. It's at Nova Place on the north side. Hey, if you want to get in, you know me and Alex. So all you got to do is when you go on uh, to buy tickets, put in the discount code SASSON, S-A-S-S-O-N, you get five bucks off, which means you get like a free drink or two. Five whole dollars. Five whole big time bucks. So again, support them. And again, if you want something to do this weekend in the Allentown Business District, the La Creme Music Festival in the Allentown Business District this Saturday, October the 6th from 1 o'clock p.m. until the rockin' stops. Rain or shine, I was told. Rain or shine, they're going to be doing it. Hot damn. Someone else who does things rain or shine is Alex. She loves to drink. And that's why we love her segment, Bar Thoughts and Experiences with Alex. Alex, play your theme song. Maybe y'all can relate. My style's dope and he waved it just slice it. It's a fresh cut, hope that you like it. About to open up a can of some... That's my song. There it is, your song. And it's a wonderful song about pizza and love. So this weekend, my drinking was a little bit different than normal uh, okay. because I was drinking with my family, mm-hmm. uh, with my sister and my parents and my two older cousins. Mm-hmm. Uh, we went to a bunch of wineries and got wine drunk. What's the difference between what, what's the different levels of drunk? Wine drunk, whiskey drunk, beer drunk. What? Are, what? How does each affect Alex? Um, Usually beer drunk. I'm not typically ever beer drunk. Okay. That hardly ever happens. I never want to drink that many beers to okay. be beer drunk. Mm-hmm. Um, whiskey drunk's probably the worst, Alex. Okay. Well, I mean best Alex, but most drunk. Okay. Um, when do you get really mean and say mean things to me? Tequila. Okay. Yeah. That's tequila. That's when evil Alex comes out. Yeah, it's the only reason I had holes in my old apartment. In the walls. You used to punch holes in the wall. No, no, I made people punch holes in the wall. <laughs> Why? Because they got mad at you? <laughs> yeah, because I was mean. Oh, okay. Well, don't serve Alex tequila is what it comes down to. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and wine then wine drunk is just like silly? nice and nostalgic and, uh, and, and silly good. drunk. Yeah. You're big into the red wines. Love red wine. White I don't, wines? White wines for pussies, honestly. Really? It's yeah. for big wimps? Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, that's what Alex says. White wine, big wimps. Go ahead. Um, so we went to a bunch of wineries, and we were talking um, a lot about my cousins being younger and stuff. And my one cousin used to be a telephone operator, which I thought was super cool. Um, but also, we were talking about swearing and how it used to be so much different. As my mom, now it, now that she listens to this show, I, I don't swear in front of my mom ever or in okay. front of my family. Mm-hmm. Um, so she didn't really know before this like how much I do swear. Yeah. And she now you're, you're, it's an issue. We've brought it up. Now she she says that I'm the worst potty mouth of the family. Really, of the whole family. The whole family. Like You've got cousins, the, everyone combined. You're the potty mouth. It's me. She, she wants to take the she wants to take that the, the dial soap and try to clean your mouth out. Is mm-hmm. what it comes down to. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think as long as I don't say it in front of her, uh-huh. that's probably the best thing. Do you feel this show has revealed yourself a little bit? Like she knows you better and what kind of human being she really <laughs> raised because of the Mike Sasson show? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> in like all of the wrong ways. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, my sister I, my sister was on the phone with her a little while ago and she was really upset about something. And I think that she said, fuck. And my mom was like, what? What are you saying? You sound like Alex. (laughs) 
Um, it's not me. It was. It was not that I encouraged her. It's no. that she's a. She's just a. She's just a potty mouth from the beginning. That's just what happened. It's society. It had nothing to do with you. It was society. Go and ahead. then my cousins and stuff were talking about how like they never swear. Uh-huh. Like never ever swear. Okay. And they can count like how many times they have sworn like okay. how, how many times they've sent a certain word and they were talking about how back in the day like it used to be very like you would never swear in front of a lady like that was very frowned upon mm. and i thought that was very interesting now because you can't you can't imagine that you can't imagine like if you said a swear word i'd be like oh that's not last <laughs> week i was actually around someone and i i said a swear word and someone did go <laughs> There's a lady present. Yeah, I, I've, I've just like it's so weird to think about. Yeah. Because because I, of your gender, I'm, I should, I should watch my mouth, which again is old school and needs yeah. to die, but whatever. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't really believe it. No, I don't I, believe it at all. Absolutely. No. Yeah. And then, I mean, you know, if we want women to be equal, we yeah. should be able to swear, and men should well, be able to swear at us, unless it's mean. Well, I, I, well, yeah. Again, there's a difference between mean swearing and like around us, maybe not at. Yeah, I mean, there's mean swearing, and then there's just like you know a descriptive of something and just embellishing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, something falls on your foot. The big yeah, the big thing that always happens in terms of comedy is the battle between clean humor and you know the blue humor or whatever like that. Right. Which a huge win for the swearing public was when Bill Cosby went down. Right. Because he was like the king of quote-unquote clean comedy. Mm-hmm. And since he's a raping scumbag, it really hurt the whole, like, <laughs> yeah. it really hurt their their case that, like, anytime you bring up Bill Cosby now, it's like, well, you know, Bill Cosby, like, raping scumbag. You're like, oh, yes, we shouldn't bring him oh, up at all. Oh, right, yeah, he doesn't prove anything. But I remember when one of my first memories of, of swearing, and it really affected me, was I was in first grade. Okay. And something happened that that really blew my first grade mind. <laughs> and so I said, I went, oh, fuck. And my teacher just absolutely blew up at me. Yeah. Just like like I had lit her, the table on fire. Like I had just shot one of my classmates. And she screams at me, just absolutely screams at me. You go to the principal right now. You like like and I'm again first grade Mike. And so I'm I start like crying and I start walking out. I'm like, I'm sorry. Oh. And so I'm walking, and O'Hare Elementary School, which is where I went to school, is it was used to be a middle school, so it's actually really big. And the first grade classroom was like way at the other end. Yeah. So I'm like this, you know, chubby kid crying all the way to the principal's office. And then when I get to the principal's office, the I remember Mrs. Krause, who was the um, secretary. I sat there and I was crying, and Mrs. Krause sits there, and goes, oh, "What's what's wrong?" I go, "I I swore in class, and I'm supposed to tell the principal I'm so sorry." And she just goes, "My," she goes, "You know, you're not going to do it again. You you can go. You're good." And now, if I was a parent. And you made my first year. I mean, th- there's a different ways to correct a first grader, yeah. as opposed to scarring them to when they're po- they're they're 41 years old and they're still freaking reliving the moment, which just proves again, teachers are horrible people. Go ahead, Alex. I just think it would be. I think I would have a really hard time not laughing at like a six year old child when they say fuck. You know, you wouldn't freak out and throw them out of the room. No, I would have it like that would be so cute. You know, like mm-hmm. their tiny little voice saying that I, would, I was I six would... foot three at the time. So maybe that was <laughs> maybe why she was a little whatever about it. But no, I'd have I'd have such a hard time not laughing. That's why I don't think that I would be able to like enforce that in my children. See, I would sit there and again, it's all about there's different like, I mean, when I was on terrestrial radio, I never even got close to swearing. Right. Because it, I, I, I would talk like I would, you know, in public. And I, I've never gotten close to swearing in a sales, per, you know, position. Right, yeah. I've never got – I mean, I can control it. And I think that there's a time where you, 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 you can swear. Now, one of the funny things about – they've always said in terms of sales, and they've actually proven this, if you can swear in front of a customer, it actually makes that customer trust you more. Oh, yeah. So yeah. if you can sit there and be like, yeah, this – I'll be honest with you. This is a great fucking dishwasher. Yeah. They all of a sudden sit there and be like, "Okay, this guy's not. This guy's not lying to me." <laughs> like you shouldn't go up to him media and be like, "Hey, how the fuck you doing?" You know, yeah. you don't do that. Right. But if like eventually you get it close enough to the person where you can sit there and be like, "Hey, you know, I'll be honest with you. 
this thing's a piece of shit. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, now I'm getting the real stuff and all that other kind right. of good stuff. Yeah. But, I mean, I think what really it comes down to is everything from the past was bad, and the future will be a swear-filled utopia in which everyone will be free. <laughs> Sure, Mike. That's how I that took sounds, it. That sounds great. There you go. Again, Alex, thank you very much for your bar thought and experience. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And you know who else is here? Derek Minto is coming up next. He is part of, I think, one of the great things that is going on in the city of Pittsburgh right now. Hambones every weekend is going to become the Burning Bridges Comedy Club at Hambones. We're going to be talking about it right after this break. He's going to be sitting in that chair. We're going to be talking about comedy and his experiences doing comedy in Pittsburgh and hosting the best open mic in the city of Pittsburgh. Again, it's Derek Minto coming up after this. It's the Mike Sasson Show on the River's Edge, www.riversedgepgh.com. We'll be right back. are listening to the Mike Sasson Show on the River's Edge at www.riversedgepgh.com or you're listening to us on the TuneIn Radio app across the planet Earth or you are listening to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, or Google Play or watching us on Facebook Live. Again, if you want to, uh, again, because you know us, you get the hookup. Pittsburgh Libation Festival, the kickoff celebration is October 12th at 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. at Nova Place. If you want five bucks off, just put into the discount a uh, uh, little space there, Sasson, S-A-S-S-O-N, and you get five bucks off a VIP ticket. So take care of that. Now, if you want something to do every weekend and you love comedy and if you watch The Mike Sasson Show or listen to The Mike Sasson Show, there's about a 50-50 chance you like comedy. But here's the deal. A great new comedy club is coming to the city of Pittsburgh at Hambones, where you can watch it, without a doubt, the best open mic in the city of Pittsburgh every Thursday. And I have someone here who I've been performing comedy with throughout western Pennsylvania over the last six or seven years. It is Derek Minto, who is part of the Burning Bridges Comedy Club at Hambones. How you doing, Derek? I, I, I am excellent, Mike. Can I, can I just start out by saying how extremely jealous I am that your name is now a discount code somewhere? <laughs> and that has never happened to me in the history of my life. Like No one has ever put Minto in anything good has ever happened in any form whatsoever. I'm very jealous. There are certain things that prove that you have risen to a level of fame, and for someone to get five bucks off something by putting your last name into something, it like I it was slightly just, but I am seriously a little jealous. It's kind of cool, like <laughs> you did it, Mike. Thank you. You finally you you made it. Now the problem is if you put Sasson in the code to get something at the comedy club, I think John Dick Winters charges you five bucks more. No, it's actually twenty. Yes. Uh, no, I, I, I did that myself. <laughs> Uh, that that was a little a personal thing I did. So what's hap- So again, if you've ever been to Hambones, it's a great uh, place. I've done comedy there. Obviously, every Thursday you can see the best comedians who are going coming through the city of Pittsburgh or perform in the city of Pittsburgh, performing there on that stage. When did it, the the idea come on to just go? Hey, let's make this into every weekend a showcase for stand up comedy. So I mean. It, it, over the past three or four years, it, it became more and more evidence at Hambones in Lawrenceville. It kind of became the stand-up hub. Uh, it was just, it happened, we happened to have a really good Thursday open mic. Thursday night is a prime night for stand-ups. Usually if you have shows on the weekend, you want to go out. So this open mic just kept growing and growing and growing. And I think on our fifth anniversary, we had like 50 comics show up. Uh, and I still turn people away. Like, But I put up 50 just because it was a fifth anniversary. Yeah. And so about a year ago, we... I played around. I did. I did a whole month of comedy there, and I, you know, I, I came back to the idea, and I'm like, I can't do this by myself. This is crazy. Like, I, and I did everything by myself. Like, I promoted it by myself. I wrote all the press releases. I made all the posters. I set up all the shows. I did it all by myself, and I, it was like having another job. Yeah. Like, it was way too much crap. Like, I, I went insane, and I'm like, I don't want to do this by myself. And so I just put the idea on a shelf, and so right around that time, John, John approached me. Uh, John Dick Winters. Uh, yeah. He's he's my partner in all this. He's the founder of the Burning Bridges Comedy Festival, and yeah. I think going had its third uh, and third festival this past yeah. weekend. The top uh, alt festival here in the city of Pittsburgh. Oh yeah, far. absolutely. No, I mean yeah. it's it's the biggest stand up. Like, I mean, there's the Pittsburgh Comedy Festival, but like that's a the pure that's a pure stand up festival. It, it's yeah. a very completely different feel to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
in terms of that festival. And Hambones has been the hub for that. Just it just kind of naturally became that way. It was like the club in which we did it at. And so And it also became the place to where if you had a show someplace else and you were one of the other comics, you came back to hang out afterwards. Yeah. And that was one of the cool things as well. I I never can walk into that place and not like see another comic. Like it's like maybe at like two o'clock in the afternoon when all like the the the, the pro drinking league is there, you know, <laughs> the people who love alcohol in a way I don't understand. Yeah, uh, those people. But it, it it's a place where I constantly it's like, well, where do you guys want to go? It's like, let's well, just go to Hambones because it's there's there'll be someone there we can hang out with, and it's cheap. Jeff Holt is a great human being. He's the owner of the place. He's letting us do this. He's crazy. Uh, for letting us do it. Uh, as in far a good as way. Yeah, in, in a good way. way. Yeah. No, it, so this is the thing. It's really hard about comedy, especially when you're producing it in a city that kind of had like a smaller scene. And it's been growing. It's, it's really hard to find bartenders or, or bar owners that actually give a crap about it. Uh, that Most places see it as like karaoke, right? Yeah. Like they see it as just, you know, a lot of audience members do too. It's just something to see or do. And, and then the other thing that I've always found in terms of comedy is – Unlike karaoke, it's very hard for someone who is in the bar who watches someone do karaoke to get offended to the point to where they're never going to come back to that bar. <laughs> this is a really bad song. Yeah, yeah. It, it keeps like, I can't believe how much you butchered It's Raining Men. You let three people do in a Ghana de Vida in a row. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm never eating my tacos here. Yeah. <laughs> but in terms of, I have seen people get upset at something they saw in stand-up comedy at a bar and literally just walk out and the bar owner's not going to typically be happy, but Jeff is, it, it, he understands that how much the, the stand-up is helping his bar and also the fact that it's help, his bar has become a hub, just like you said, for so many great comics, not only in Pittsburgh, but outside of Pittsburgh to come in. Yeah, I mean, even outside of stand-up, like, Himbo's is just a, a really interesting performance venue. Yeah. It has it has the like, the widest and weirdest variety of stuff I've ever seen in a place. Like there's like a game night, there's trivia night, there's like jazz standards night, there's a bluegrass night, there's an a regular acoustic open mic, there's two comedy open mics, and one of which used to be a mixed improv open mic. Yeah. And then on top of that, there was like there was a children's open mic. I the children had an open mic. Yes. Like. I didn't even know children needed more stage time, yes. but apparently they do. They need work on being children is what yeah. happens, yeah. Now, but the thing is, is that now there has been a little bit of pushback, you said, or at least I think you said, because of the fact that now it's going to be every weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, stand-up comedy. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think it was just, I, I think at per first people really thought that the stand-up community was taking something away from the music community, mm -hmm. which, I, I mean, I can see that perspective for a brief moment, but when, then when you really look at the greater picture of everything, think how many bars outside of the three stand-up theater, or three comedy theaters that you have, and the improv, they are actually dedicate, have a dedicated night every night of the week for comedy shows. None. Like, that doesn't exist. Like, there's open mics, but... This is, and just ha taking this opportunity, and there, of course there were some people who were like, you're taking away. It's like, no, it's just what we're saying is that rather than us ta uh, us sharing nights where like we go back and forth on those Fridays, it was like, we're going to do Saturdays. You guys can have all the Fridays. We're not taking away your sweet, sweet, sweet Fridays. Oh, your sweet, sweet Fridays. No, you keep them, and we're going to and we're gonna still share Sundays. So Now, then what's great is, is that there's nothing like this in this community in Pittsburgh. You're going to bring in national touring people, people that have been on television, people that have worked with some of the biggest names in stand-up, and bring them to Handbones and have them in a, the most intimate setting that you could possibly – which is where you want to watch comedy. Yeah. Like if you ever sit there and you talk to someone who is from a New York or L.A., they, you, you don't want to watch – Bill Burr at the forum. You want to watch Bill Burr at one in the morning at you know the comedy store, and you know, that's where you want to watch Seinfeld. That's where you want to watch, and you're going to see people that you know are have already been on television, and who knows where they could be in you know a year or five years or whatever. Two feet in front of you in a very intimate setting where they're going to be able to really explore their their acts and really be able to just kind of. The, it's the purest form of stand-up comedy you're going to be able to see. I, I mean, that, that, thank you for that's a really great articulation of that. Like, so this is the thing that me and John, like, we we, we were talking, we we're first going through all this stuff, John Dick Winters, you know, and like we were talking about like what we were going to do and what we were kind of worried about. We both we realized we both agreed on this one particular thing is that we didn't want to make a place 
to make money. Like we, the, the plan isn't here. It's like, ha ha ha! We've reined in all the comedy to make the money. Like we, we don't, we know we're not going to make any money. We don't want. That's not the point. We wanted to encourage the comedy scene in the city and to be give people an opportunity to see these acts that they're not, that they wouldn't be able to see at the Pittsburgh Improv, and to build a place up that people can recognize and that will be able to come back to because it has good quality comedy that's curated and, and made sure that we're putting up the best comics in the city. And people like the shows are controlled and well put together and manicured in such a way that like you wouldn't tell people about that what you saw. You're like, yeah. I saw this crazy show at this place. Like, we want people to be able to really appreciate the scene. There is this crazy scene in Pittsburgh that's like blowing up, and no one like is really like some people know about it. People are across the country are starting to recognize it, but we want to make sure that people. There's so many people in the city of Pittsburgh that only think comedy happens at the Pittsburgh Improv. Yes, and improv, the Pittsburgh Improv has tons of great shows, but the Pittsburgh Improv is also a huge institution. That yes, you, when you go in there, you got to get two drinks or a drink and a meal, and, and you might be sitting in the back row, and the stand-up comic could be fifty feet away from you. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you're not going to have kind of an intimate thing, like where you can talk with them, interact with them, uh, and it's it's just a completely different experience. Like we want to give somebody something that's close up and tangible, and it's accessible from any price point. Now, like, let me ask you, who, who who so far has been booked? I know this weekend it's Sam Talent, correct? Sam Talent. Uh, we have Bill Crawford. Uh, we have Ben Roy. Uh, I think we have, John, we have John Kelly, I think, in February. Mm. Um, we have a bunch of – we have Stuart Huff uh, in January. Uh, and where are some of the places? The, I mean, obviously, uh, Bill Crawford, WDVE morning show yeah. has performed with Steve Byrne, and, and obviously one of the the biggest names in he town. Was on, he was on two episodes of Sullivan and Son. Yes, he was, and uh, <laughs> and also uh, Sam Talent. He's he's been on television. He, he's Comedy been on Viceland, Comedy Central. All the comics in the first month, uh, all have either been on Comedy Central or have some kind of TV credit, uh, which is really important. We wanted to make sure, we wanted to try to build, branch out and make these names like. Be, listen, at the end of the day, if you're a comedy noob, being able to see somebody that has a real TV credit is helpful and encouraging to be like, this person's probably no slouch. Mm -hmm. Well, like, well, what we can do is we can put somebody up who has real credits, who people will want to come out and see, and they'll be able to see other people yeah. uh, who ha are great in this scene mm -hmm. and be able to showcase them in front of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, how would and, and is the easiest way to get tickets just show up at the door? I mean, or is there any places the, you can get them? The two best ways is to go to Burning Bridges Comedy Club. Uh, we, every single show has tickets. There's no ticketing fee whatsoever. Uh, and we clo we, have, we have a cap basically right on there. Uh, there's no ticketing fee, but yeah, it's www.burningbridgescomedyclub. Or if you even type in a comedy festival, it comes up on the same. There's a front page that will lead you to either one of them. Uh, you can buy them at the door. We don't guarantee a seat uh, for you, but if you buy a ticket online, uh, because right now we max out at probably about 80, 90 seats. Mm -hmm. So, and that's like if we take out like. Like last night, we we <laughs> we had an army of people who tore apart the room to see the maximum amount of chairs and tables and like the max the most, the perfect setup that we could put together, like for the room, uh -huh. uh, just to figure that out. But yeah, no, definitely the best way to do it is either do it online. And if you show up at the door, you can still buy the tickets the exact same price, uh, but it you might not be able to get in. Yeah. So again, Thursday night still the best open mic in the city. Monday still the great open mic. Uh, Monday night, and then also so it'll be Saturday night, and then Sunday night's going to be something unique as they're going to be uh, essentially a comic who will be every Sunday for a month, basically doing residency. Yeah. So uh, we, I, I'm sure you know this. Like this is something you find out in stand up very quickly is that there's like no Sunday shows. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know if it's because church or what exactly it is or just everyone's like we need a night of rest. But, you know, other than, like, big clubs, like, you really don't find them. I mean, Pittsburgh's a sports town, so, you know, it kind of makes sense that you don't really see that a lot yeah. here. Like, the Sunday mics that we've had in this city, I know you've endured, yeah. uh, are hard. <laughs> are hard, sad places. Uh, but people don't like going out on Sunday. They like to stay home and get drunk. I don't know. But we realized that there was this kind of this gap in this area, that there was no Sunday show. And so we talked with Jeff about building this kind of show, and at the same time, John had this idea he'd seen in other places, and I'd seen up in Boston, uh, where they have a comic who's kind of in residence for the month that they're on in a bunch of the other shows. And so every Sunday, there's a show called The Residency. And what they'll do, that comic will be the featured performer on each one of those shows. And what's great is some of those shows, we're going to have the headliners uh, from the Saturday show. They're going to be on the show, too. Uh, and that comic gets to do a variety of different things. They either focus on hosting or, like, they get to basically 
to try to sit there and hone their skills, like mm-hmm. something they might lack in. Mm-hmm. Whether it be like hosting, or maybe they want to work on their crowd work, or maybe they want to work on storytelling or something like that. Uh, so it's kind of the, it's it's a deliberate set of shows to encourage a comic to grow. Somebody who's already become decent in the scene and more than serviceable on stage, but to kind of help them to move to the next level. And they, in turn, they help us produce some of the shows. Uh, they work in tandem with us. Uh, so for this month is uh, Ian McIntosh, yes. uh, which we're really excited about. Uh, Ian was like right on board right away. Uh, and like the thing that's kind of fun about it, especially the, because he's the first one, is like we don't know everything of how it's going to work. Like we're not sure if this part of it, if, if having Ian produce these shows is the best way to do this or not. So it's we're learning just as much as he is. But yeah, those Sunday shows are going to be great. Uh, they're going to be nine o'clock uh, at Hambones, uh, and you can just buy tickets for those. They're they're actually they're cheaper. They're just five dollars, uh, and it's going to be fun. Time. So again, Thursday nine thirty ish. Is the uh, the pit is the is still the open mic? So if you want to see open mic comedy, which if you've never seen it, it's the comedians typically do, especially if there's like 50 of them, typically do around three to four minutes of comedy. Uh, you'll see some great comedians. You'll see some comedians that should honestly look for something else to do with their lives. But it'll make you feel better about yourself as yeah. a person because you're like, well, at least I know what I'm doing. Yeah, like, seriously. It's you say it before. It's like you will now judge someone if they get to continue with their dream. So if you have ever really want to feel that level of power over somebody else, open mic comedy is the type of place that you should be being an audience member of. Yeah, it, 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 this is the thing. If you go in there open mind and you just accept that someone's getting on stage and they're brave enough to try this – because, I mean, the one thing that I know you've definitely heard this a million times, like, you were so brave. You yeah. were so brave for getting up on that stage and telling jokes. I always try to explain to people, I'm like, it's not that I'm brave, actually. It's just that I have a compulsion to be in front of people and yeah. to have my ego massaged. Yeah. That's what it I is. I need for... love, and this is the place yeah. I can get it. But it, 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 the, the first time you go on stage is hard. Yes. It's terrifying. It, it's so many people I just have to keep trying to tell the exact same thing to over and over again. It's just, just go do it. Yes. Nothing bad will happen to you. No one's going to come we, out. We, we've done that in tandem sometimes is that someone will show up to, to, to hand bones and someone will be like, my friend wants to do stand up. And then they'll be like, oh, I just want to watch. And you and I will just be like, just do it. Just, just, just yeah, go up there. Do that happened seconds. like last week or yeah. two weeks ago. We yeah. were screaming at a guy and got on stage. Yeah, we kind of bullied him to go on stage, which, yeah. you know, sometimes bullying can work yeah. in positive ways. Yeah. Now, in terms of the Hambones open mic, I have myself have seen uh, Craig, Craig Gass has been on that stage, mm-hmm. uh, Hannibal Burris. Yes. Um, who else can you think of that? Uh, uh, Rich has, Voss. Um, I think, uh, I, I think uh, he, I, he followed me. And that, yes. And yeah. then. <laughs> Shut up. Yeah, he's like, uh, I want this guy to uh, open for me. No, he, he basically, it was one of those things of like, he was doing like stuff that he literally was like on a table and everyone's like, ooh, it's Rich Vaz. And he goes up today and everyone who was like before or after him going like, that better be new stuff. Can, no. I, can, I, can I tell you something kind <laughs> of messed up? up? Right. I didn't know who he was until that night. <laughs> I knew the face. I knew, this is the thing, when I saw him, I was like, oh, okay, but when they said the name and like all the other stuff, like the, imp- like it was like Matt, Matt White, yeah. like messaged me, he's like, cause he, like, he works in the improv, yeah. and he's like, hey, he wants to come over and do some more stage time, can we send him over? I'm like, yeah. And I was like, hey, who is this? <laughs> and someone's like, what? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know who every comic is. How well did Hannibal Burris do? Oh my god, it was the best time. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the only Alex time. is a huge Hannibal Burris fan, so this makes her feel bad that he was doing a uh, an open mic set in Pittsburgh. So in this, th- this is so funny. There, there, he, this comic he opened for him, brought him over. Yeah, he was drunk out of his mind, and he's like, "This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna reset the show." And so, like, we just suddenly reset the show. I did, like, ten minutes. Like, the room filled in. This guy, this other guy goes up. I'm not going to name his name. Yeah, we know. Yeah, and he was incredibly drunk, did an awful set. Mm-hmm. And then Hannibal Burris spent the first five minutes of his set tearing him apart. <laughs> and it was, I, like, I was, like, I'm like, this is the greatest gift that's ever been given to me in the history of my life. No moment will ever come better. And so far, nothing better has ever happened to me. Yeah. It was the best. And then he just hung out. Yeah. Like, and it wasn't like he wasn't weird about it. He was just like a dude there. People came up. He talked to them. Well, that's the thing about like, it. That's one thing I've, I've experienced in terms of stand-up. It's I Now it's weird that I'm now Facebook friends with probably now about 
15 to 20 people that have been on that have had Netflix specials or Comedy Central specials. And I didn't I wasn't like a fanboy or whatever. I just have met them along the way where they've come through Pittsburgh or I was in New York or LA or something like that. And every story is exactly the same. Literally it's after a set we just go off to on, you know, outside on the corner and we're just talking about whatever. And it really is like this community of comedy. And if, again, when you talk about what's great about having this experience, you might get that at the Pittsburgh Improv, but you know, and I've worked the Pittsburgh Improv, you've yeah. worked the Pittsburgh Improv. It's a unique experience, and you see some of the greatest comedians on the planet. And again, at the Benenum or at you know at Console Energy, you'll see the Kevin Hart's of the world. You'll see those people. But the thing about the ha- you're going to not only be able to see these guys, but afterwards they're going to be at the bar. Mm-hmm. They're going to be outside smoking. They're, you know, and so if you do truly want to say you met this guy, this is the best chance you'll ever have. Now, I'm not saying he's going to be or she's going to be the nicest human being in the world and go, oh, yes, let's discuss yeah, life I for mean, 45 it, minutes. It, but like, typically they are, if you're cool, going to be very cool. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, you have to remember, like, I always try to remember when I interact with anybody. It's just like, you ever have a crappy day? Yes. <laughs> and you don't want to deal with anybody? Yes. Yeah. I mean, and especially if you know what comics are like. Yeah. Like how, like, generally, for whatever reason, comedy doesn't detract the most mentally stable human beings. Yes. Like, even, the, like, the thing that always scared me the most about comics is the more they put, the more they seem put together, they, I, like, I know that somewhere out there there's, like, this weird Dexter personality that they're just hiding and waiting to murder and maim, or they're awful in some way. You're looking at me a little too tight. (laughs) You should be looking at me too tight as well. Like, someone once said to me that I was, they're like, you're like the most put together comic in the city. And I just couldn't, I couldn't stop laughing for like an hour. I'm like, what are you talking about? I got, I got, I got from, I got from a comic once. They go, you're the biggest mystery in comedy. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, what do you do all day? I go, work, sleep, eat, work out, do comedy. Like, I don't do anything else. I don't Why like, is that? A, did he ever ask you? That's not a mystery if he doesn't at least ask once. Yeah. Like, that's dumb. I love it. He's just like, what do you do? Like, I, like, I guess they did think they're like, and then I bury the bodies. No, I mean, it's like, no, I just, I do work, I eat, and I sleep, bury and I, you know, I do comedy constantly. And one place I love doing it is Hambones. Again, where can people get tickets? Oh, you get it at www.burningbridgescomedyclub.com. Or if you go to festival, that's fine too. Or you just look up Burning Bridges Comedy Festival. You can look us up on the 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 the, the Tweetergrams uh, as BB Comedy Club on Instagram. It's just Burning Bridges Comedy Club on Facebook. You can check up Burning Bridges Comedy Club. Burning Bridges Comedy Club everywhere. You can check my tramp stamp on the back of my bag. Absolutely. Right lower there, it says Burning Bridges Comedy Club. It's not actually apparent. It's a henna thing. Okay. And it's got two little scorpions on the side of it because that's what was my choice yep. as the person getting henna Absolutely. Uh, so you can check that out because well, usually my butt's hanging out a little bit. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty good advertising. Yeah. Uh, but and I, most yeah. people are looking at your butt when you walk past. Yeah, just I, so you I, know. I, yeah, I know. Because it's, it's a weird. sweet deuce. I'm it's, just it's, telling it's, you. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Alex, oh chime in a little bit. You, you, Derek's butt. Just have... banging. It's ba- yes? It's banging. You got a, it's banging from Alex That Clements. was the most unbelievable. <laughs> you didn't even put a comma in there. You were just like, yes, banging. <laughs> <laughs> yes, banging. <laughs> just, I have, you get A for effort. Co-host Thank with the you. Moses. Thank you very much. Again, Derek Minto, can you hang around? We're going to have yeah, a couple absolutely. more segments, yeah, and then we're going to be talking. We'll be right back. Quick break. Again, Derek Minto, Support local comedy. Support the uh, Burning Bridges Comedy Club at Hambones. My name is Mike Sasson. You're watching the Mike Sasson Show. You're listening to us on www.riversedgepgh.com. On the River's Edge, we'll be back. You are listening to The Mike Sasson Show on The River's Edge, again, at www.riversedgepgh.com. Thank you again. Derek Bento is still with us. He's going to be hanging out. We're going to be doing the greatest segment in the history of the world where I, I as, a, as an elder statesman, try to expose my co-host, Alex, to some of the greatest music in the history of the world. It is Fresh Eyes. Alex, play your theme song. No love like a country girl with money. 
character, so you know there's literally no relation to the segment Fresh Eyes what and that song. What do you mean? Song. What is it? There's no <laughs> love of the country girl with money? Yeah. And how does that... Because I, you make me listen to songs that I hate all the time, so I had to pick a song that I knew that you would hate. It yes. has all of the relations. Yeah, that... Re- okay, that does make sense, because I really dislike that I know. song. I didn't, I didn't like it either. I didn't know I was, we were allowed to give our opinions about stuff like that. <laughs> no, I you're not said, allowed to give your opinions about I didn't know whose choice songs. was. I thought it was Mike's. I'm like, Mike was nice enough to put me on this show. Maybe, <laughs> or maybe you're really super in charge. It's just he's a, like, it's a title. No, well, it's t- t- it's a title. She's completely in charge. Okay. Yeah, it's just, this whole thing I, falls. I, I control I really everything that he says. Actually, there's ninety two. <laughs> you can you can control. There's ninety seven computers in front of her. She's she's the. <laughs> She's there the, are a lot of you yeah. are the lady in the chair right now. Yes. You're just like I. I'm right, not really doing anything. Street. No right, no right. You know, like the okay. sweet heisty thing. There you go. Uh, now, as you know, if you've listened to the show consistently out there in Internet Radio Land, in in Fresh Eyes, I have Alex watch a performer from a previous generation, and she gives her fresh take on it. This week, it is. The greatest guitar player. I'm just gonna. I'm not even gonna say arguably. I'm gonna say the greatest guitar player, the most influential guitar player in the history of recorded music. I'm talking about Jimi Hendrix. 1967 to 1970 was all, four years. Yeah. Is all he was. Uh, again, he now he did some things previously. He was with Little Richard. He was you know with some other bands. He actually was in the army for a year. Yeah. Uh, and but. He got uh, kicked out. Got kicked out. He had an honorable discharge. They called yeah, it. Yeah, kicked out. I Fancy think they just. I, yeah, they wanted him out of there, because he was just too. He was too real, Alex. That's how the army couldn't take his jimminess. He probably played too much guitar in the army. There you go. They're like, we can't do this. You need to, like, <laughs> you need to march and stuff and, yeah. and kill people. Yeah. He was like the only guy that ever got away with it, because everyone would have seen him do that. They would have been like, oh, I'm gonna play too much guitar too. Then. <laughs> yeah. like, but the way he played it, it was incredible. So again. Uh, uh, it's weird about the 60s. There's so many amazing artists, and then you look at their careers. Like the Beatles was essentially 1964 to 1970. Yeah. And then you look at the Doors, or you know, 1967, 1970. It's so, so quick. Janis Joplin, so quick. Again, Jimi Hendrix came on. He only really had one number one album. He was actually bigger in most of his career in England, even though he was an American. He was born in Seattle, Washington. Um, passed away when he was 27 because of an overdose of barbiturates, which, you know, make sure you – kids, make don't sure you take care of your barbiturates. I'm so young. I don't even know what barbiturates are. I'm not even sure what they are. I think they're diet pills. That's what they sound like. Oh, I don't even know what they're lame. Yeah, I don't even know. I don't think it, – whatever. It sounds – someone text me, message me what the hell barbiturates are. Anyway, so – I had Alex watch a couple clips. A couple. One was from a German television show where he played Purple Haze, one of his huge hits. Also from a Miami uh, festival in which he played one of his uh, other hits, Foxy Lady. Then his famous rendition of the Star Spangled Banner from his performance at Woodstock, which we'll, we'll get into that. And also his entrance into uh, pop stardom in the United States at the Monterey Pop Festival when he lit his guitar on fire. Yeah. Now, we'll start with that. That was a cool story when I read about that was because it was the first major show in America for The Who and Jimi Hendrix. And The Who came on before him, and The Who was being very Who-like and blew the doors off the stage. And I don't even know if that's a real slang. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, that's why you describe yeah. you very... Hoovian. Yeah, like, I tried. It behooves one. It to behooves. Be that. Yeah. But destroyed, and they destroyed their 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 stage. They destroyed like their their the Keith Moon was being crazy, all that kind of stuff. So Jimi Hendrix, being the performer that he is, didn't want to get outshone. Didn't want to get shown up. So he, at the end of his set, by the way, during his set, he was humping the stage, humping. His and this is 1967. Very nicely, yeah, yeah. Humping his his guitar, humping everything in and sight. You have, to, you have to remember at that time, no one had ever humped anything before. Yeah, no one had humped <laughs> a jello. Ever in existence? No, yeah. dogs didn't do it. Nothing. No Jimmy Hendrix knew. invented humping. He invented humping. Your grandparents had sex while they just stood with each other and prayed. That's yeah. all they did. That's all sex was just until 1967. That's not humping. Yeah, that's and they humping. did just and that's then just, your mo- and then your grandmother just... said a rosary, and that's how your dad was born. Yeah. Anyway, so. So he, what he did was, he's like, okay, no one's going to show me up. He switched guitars because he didn't want to do his nice one. And he lit his guitar on fire, and that's the picture you see there. And yeah, he almost yeah. like, and by the way, that picture was taken by someone who was 17 at the time. 
That's that was that's how rock was in 1967. Someone could get that close at 17 years old to take a picture in one of the most famous pictures in the history of rock. Um, so, Alex, that's the first one. What did you think of his lighting the guitar on fire? I mean, I, I don't think that you can say anything but it being pretty uh, awesome and uh, <laughs> impressive. I don't really think that there's anything else to say about it. I, I was so ready for you to talk a bunch of crap on it. So I wasn't. Right. I'm not going to talk a bunch of crap <laughs> on that specifically okay, then, because it was really cool. All right. Then let's move on because I want to – because the, the fun of the segment is you shitting on things. Um, let's go to uh, the two segments that I think are the most similar – Foxy Lady and the Purple Haze performance. The Purple Haze performance was from German television. The Foxy Lady was from the Miami um, Pop Festival, which, by the way, by the time he retired in 1969 and 1970, he was the highest paid live performer in the country. He was, yeah, he was. That's crazy. He was, yeah, it was like, he got, I think, something ridiculous, like a couple hundred thousand dollars to perform at Woodstock, which is why the, the weird story about him doing the Star Spangled Banner, that was the next, that was like Monday morning. Yeah. It was most of the crowd had already left, and everyone who was there was waking up to Jimi Hendrix performing at like 6 a.m., 7 a.m., and the reason why he did was because the promoters were like, well, we paid you this huge sum, perform. And so if you watch, like, they do a wide shot, it's mostly just garbage and then just a bunch of kids watching an incredible performance. Which, which is very eloquent in a way if you think about him playing that song that way he did to a bunch of garbage. <laughs> to a bunch of garbage. <laughs> like, it kind of, it's like, oh, America. Oh. Yeah, this is America. A bunch of kids sitting in a pile of garbage. Yeah, rolling around in mud feces. So that's, that's what happened. The, the My fresh eyes take of Jimi Hendrix when I saw this was if you took that performer yeah. and somehow took him in a time machine and put him in 2018. No. He would absolutely he would absolutely still be blowing people's minds. Oh, I don't think so. Why Ooh. do you think? Um, cuz I don't think that he could hold people's like attention. I think I don't now people's uh, attention is like you have to be doing a million things at once he and everything has to be crazy. He was humping his guitar. He was he was freaking yeah. lighting it on but fire. Like, he was see, dancing. He if was If you see like Foxy Lady, like mm. everyone in the crowd is sitting first of all. I think everybody in the crowd was stunned by what they were seeing. But it is like it's super impressive, and you're like, wow, he plays guitar impressively. But like, I could never sit through a whole concert of his and be like, okay, well, like this kind of sounds like this other thing that he just did. And no matter how cool he's playing it, like, this is never going to hold my attention. I think he, when I saw him, I saw that there are very few performers these days that could do what he did. And you're saying you would be bored stiff by watching Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, I mean, like, I can watch a clip of it, and I'd be like, oh, that's really cool, and that's really impressive, and I no one can play guitar like that, and I understand that. But also, I want something else. Like, I mean, in a weird like way, more singing or more any anything else. Like, in a weird way, like, it, you, I feel like you're almost kind of pointing out, like, how overstimulated everyone is. Like, yeah. Like, it, it, like, in a modern context now, you, it would be like, like, you would see, like, a clip, like, on, like, BuzzFeed, like, check out this guy who just lit his guitar on fire. Wow. Right, exactly. And then, and then you know what would happen? His promoter would be like, we got to do a YouTube series of this. And it would be him, like, lighting on different instruments on fire. And then he would be that guy. And then well, he definitely in modern times would have to end every show with lighting his guitar <laughs> on fire. That would have right? to be like how that, he would end every show. He's branded, yeah. right? You'd have to brand it. But it's also just like not my type of my, not my type of music. I really like to sing along to music, and uh -huh. there's like two words that I can sing along to in any song, and it's I don't know. It's just I would say that he again he was definitely would be in the heavy metal category. And I do like I I I definitely appreciate when he's dancing and humping things and stuff like that. That makes it much more entertaining. <laughs> um, I like that, and I love every single one of his outfits. I might start dressing like him. I think you should actually start dressing like him. I mean, if I could just wear velvet pants all the time. You would look really good with in... a big, like, big hair. Style. Yeah, yeah, that would yeah. Be good. That's going to be my new hairstyle, and I'm going to wear velvet pants every day. All right, so let's review. Alex, not a huge fan of the music in no, general. No, You think he might not be able to hold the modern youth's attention. Correct. But the fashion sense on point. Yes, fashion sense on point. I really, like, I honestly... The Star Spangled Banner was probably my favorite video that uh, you had me watch. Just because I feel like such a song that, like, okay, everyone knows the song, everyone plays the song, and it sounds the same all the time. But, like, for someone to actually make it sound any different and, like, make it sound good being different, 
I thought it was really cool. Especially when you consider this is right in the middle of the Vietnam War. This is right in the middle of a time. I mean, people are still hung up about, you know, protests during the American well, yeah, National Anthem. I mean, think about that. Think about doing that in, again, 1969 and 50 years ago, how crazy I that mean, could you, be. You look at, like, what happened, like, a show like the Smothers Brothers back then, who, like, just talked up, like, didn't even mock religion, just taught, like, had religion. And like is like a context on their show, and like how hard like censors tried to come down on them, and like you think about like people couldn't could not deal at all like with like I mean now if you you think about how like mad people are about like kneeling during the like, anthem and all that yeah. stuff, but back then it was like it was like institutionalized with every business, and like the government people still thought the government could just stop things yes. because you did that like it the way people interpreted that information it was so different than we, how we take it now like and the, but the thing that always takes me back about like those type of performers in that era is like okay it's 2018 is the world that much different as perf in performing wise from 2010 not really yeah but if you think about where the world was performance wise in 1960 till 1968 with foxy lady it's a completely different universe and i could only imagine what a 50 year old dad would be sitting there watching this you know this this black guy wearing velvet pants playing a guitar louder and weirder than anything else and singing about you know excuse me while i kiss this guy you know i mean and everyone's like that's about lsd and everything's like and they'd be like what the hell is going on here <laughs> And that's what always kind of takes me back about that whole era, about how much they really did, you know, take risks. But as performers, you always have to take risks because that's why we're still talking about them nearly 50 years later. True dat yo. True dat yo. Yep. Would you like to add anything, Alex? No, I'm good. There we go. Now, thank you very much, Alex, for that wonderful segment called Fresh Eyes. Now, we move on to our next segment, news and notes from the world of sports, gossip, and weirdness. Alex, play that theme song. Huge news in obesity. Uh, Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> is changing its name. To what? That was like a New York Post title. <laughs> <laughs> Huge news in obesity. Sorry, sorry. No, that's exactly <laughs> what you. That's why I said it because I was trying to elicit humor. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> good. Oh, I, I thought you were. Uh, I, good first, job. First good, good job. <laughs> By the way, I love when like I've done comedy shows where like I I tell a joke and I and, and because again when sometimes we do open mics and there's only like five people there. And I tell a joke and I had this one woman sit there and start go and start laughing and she goes, "Oh, I'm sorry." And I go, no, that's what I was after. <laughs> Your laughter is exactly what I was trying to get at. Yeah. But uh, again, Dunkin' Donuts, the uh, the lovely place where you get great coffee, great donuts, great bagel sandwiches, is trying to make it that people understand that you can get more than just donuts there. So starting in about a month, they're just going to be Dunkin'. I feel like that's really not that bad of a, a change. It's not like IHOP changing their shit. Well, and, I, and, that yeah. was, and that was a marketing play. Yeah. yeah. Was some we let swear on this? Yes. Yeah. Some yeah. shitty <laughs> fucking marketing ploy. <laughs> Fuck them. I went in there and like everyone was like, they were like on alert. Like they yeah. had like like enough people come in there and be like, what the hell's happening to my pancakes? <laughs> and like they were like almost instantly they could tell like me and my girlfriend to ornery fat people like yeah. in the afternoon. They're like, listen. We still have pancakes. Calm down. Yeah. I'm like, okay, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that I always love about, like, any sort – like, I always think about this. Like, when you talk about what is the name of the show that Stephen Colbert is on? It's the, you know, the Late Show with Stephen Colbert. No one calls it that. They all say, oh, we're watching Colbert. Or it's not the Tonight Show. We're watching Fallon. Yeah. Or and Or, you know, it's not McDonald's. It's Mickey D's. Whatever. The same thing with, like, they're sitting there going, oh, we're trying to be cooler and make people understand that we have more stuff. Understand, you can call yourself Dunkin' Donuts for the rest of the world. People still call you Dunkin' just in general, and people know you have other stuff. This is legitimately, just like you said, a guy who's trying to make a bonus, who's trying to sit there and be like, how do we make sure that people know that we have sandwiches? They kn people know you have sandwiches at Dunkin' Donuts. Like, who doesn't know what Dunkin' Donuts is? Like, who's never been to a Dunkin' Donuts? But that's the problem. People think that we're only donuts, Alex. 
No. Everyone knows your other things. I do, I do feel like that maybe like in 20 years from now, there will be children who grow up in the, the, the world of Duncan. Yeah. And they will go there and they'll be like, what do you mean? You mean there, all the dishes you have here, I cannot dunk into some kind of sauce. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's, that's the one thing. Like the thing, it's like, all right, you want to you want to make it into this like what adverb? Is that what that is yeah. in English? Like you want to make it into that. But you better be able to dunk every goddamn thing in that place, yes. right? Like you better have dipping sauces for your croissant, which is yeah. and every every possible thing. Like you better have a dipping sauce for your like moulatte or whatever mm -hmm. the crap they call their. Yeah, their you thing. need dipping sauces. Everything sauce. should have dipping sauces. The dipping, and then it would be okay. Yeah, the dipping sauces the need thing. dipping. Yeah. They need something that like you need is something. If you have like an icing type dipping sauce. By the way, am I the only one that misses? Like, do they still have the French toast sticks or the like, where you could dip the into the syrup at the Burger King? I, they have a Burger King, I'm pretty sure. I mean, but I remember, yeah, I used to get those all the time when I was yeah, younger. Yeah, those are the best. Yeah, those are amazing because again, it's the dipping, and then they had one. I think they actually you could do it into you could do it into syrup, or you could do it into uh, like uh, frosting. Yeah, that, that sweet creamy frosting. Yeah, oh, that was ridiculous. That, <laughs> Which also I like French dip sandwiches as well. Yeah, it's dip. fun. It's just fun to have it there because you don't always. And sometimes you like take a bite and you'll be like, oh, this is good. But you know, what? I'm gonna do it without it this time. And then, and then maybe like halfway through you made a mistake, so you re-dip real quick, and then you put it in there, and you're like, you have like a, like a, a, a one-quarter dip sandwich yeah. like in your mouth. I don't know. I have a problem. So I have problems. But no, Should I mean, I agree help? that, uh, to be honest with you, I think the whole point of Dunkin' Donuts was it was the, again, the coffee, the donuts, which I've never even thought of dunking my donut in a coffee. I used to do it because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. <laughs> like, I used to was it make it. I, I thought people were dunking in milk. I don't do that, so I don't. I thought that's a, that's what people were doing. I don't dunk. Why? Would, the only reason why you dunk cookies is because it, if it's a little harder, you want to make it a little softer, which is why chewy cookies came out. But donuts are already chewy. What would be the need of the They're, coffee in order to make it what more you know wet? Why I, would you do that? My, my guess would be donuts used to be real old. That like, could be the only reason. Mm. Like back in the day, like they made a bunch of donuts. And they're like, well, we're selling them until they're like this. Are and you then, old enough to remember the time to make the donuts guy? Yeah, I remember the time to make the donuts okay. guy. Okay, that guy yeah, was... Yeah, it looks like I was convinced him and Mario were the exact same person. There was a guy who literally did, like how they have flow right now for uh, progressive insurance. Yeah. A more famous version of flow was a dude who legitimately, the whole point of Dunkin' Donuts was every morning they had fresh donuts. So there was a guy who would always, like, he would be, time to make the donuts. And it would be a guy who would, he would, his big thing that Dunkin' Donuts had fresh donuts, and he was the guy who made the donuts. And he traveled the world as the Dunkin' Donuts guy. And he made trillions of dollars. Yeah. And I think he, honestly, he and Jeff Bezos are battling for, like, control of the universe. What does he look like now? I think he's dead. Oh, he's dead. Yeah, he's, a, he's one of those guys that didn't live real long. many donuts. Yeah, he's really dead. Yeah. But uh, Dunkin' Donuts is changing his name. By the way, speaking of a name, I saw this the other day, and I thought that this was... I love minor league baseball names. Yeah. They always are real cool, like there's the Toledo Mudcats, you know, all this That's kind of... That's really cool, yeah. Yeah, like, instead of, you know, like, obviously, every baseball, major league baseball name is just Detroit Tigers, you know, Chicago Cubs, you know, very kind of standard yeah. name type stuff. And they go a little wilder in the minor leagues. Well, to me, they just... They might have won for the coolest name in the world... The AA affiliate of the Los Angeles Angels in um, northern Alabama is going to be called next year the Rocket City Trash Pandas. <laughs> That's an amazing... I will get a, a hat for the Rocket City Trash Pandas. Who See, even came up with this, though? Like, it, was, how it, does was that... a, it was a like a contest. Yeah, I and don't get it. 45% of the people wanted Rocket City Trash Pandas. I like it. But why are they trash pandas? That's a nickname for raccoons. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's been used online before. <clears throat> like, there's like all those like alternative like this is what people call <clears throat> animals when they're high. They're like, oh look, it's a snake. It's a danger tube. Or yeah. like they're what? like it's like this big meme. Yeah. Yeah. It's from forever ago, and they used it in the movie The Gardens of the Galaxy. Yes. Uh, I think it was the second one they used it in. And that like repopularized the whole thing again. Yeah. So I'm now, very so this is almost like the kind of the Anaheim Ducks thing, where they named it after the Mighty Ducks, yeah. or you know all that kind of stuff, or the Raptors because of you know obviously Jurassic Park. And, yeah, those Raptors you know. are fucking sick. Yeah, but now it's the Rocket City Trash Pandas, which personal again amazing. I would buy season tickets, even though I'm nowhere near Northern Alabama, just to support an organization that would name itself. By the way, we're blowing past the fact that they're calling themselves Rocket City. 
That's pretty yeah, cool, I don't, too. Yeah, we're just going to let that one slide. Yeah, but then on top of that, and then they're the trash pandas. Huh. I would go see them. I'd like to see their players. Yeah. What they look like. What they're, the trash pandas look they're, like. I would assume uh, they're normal, they're normal I want them people. to be fitting with the trash pandas oh, you want to with be like that hobos? name. Yeah. Like they all, they, when they leave the game, they put all their gear into like a bindle and they put it over their yeah. shoulder and they walk out, they hop onto it. They all have to hop on trains. And but they're the still really it. good baseball players. Yes. Yeah, well, that's well, what well, I want. You have the bat, so you can do the bat with oh, the Oh, it would be a bat bindle. That would be adorable. There oh, you my go. God. Do Dude, the bat be, with the trash. We should be doing marketing for the trash. <laughs> we should really be doing that. I imagine, though, food sales would be going down at the stadium. Yeah. <laughs> well, what happens if there are actual trash pandas at the trash panda game? I think Aww. people would be a little bit... Like, I mean, they have to have a mascot, right? Yeah. I, would you have a chance to have a uh, an actual trash panda? Because like at the University of Connecticut, we actually do have a live husky dog. Yeah. So I think they should have a, a like a raccoon. Hell yeah. So that's our idea. So Northern, you know, the Rocket City Trash Pandas, our number one thing is make sure you have a live raccoon. Speaking of live raccoons, Dave Grohl of the Foo Fighters, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not real good at the whole, like, segue thing. Uh, he, <laughs> no. <laughs> he talked about this week on radio. Someone asked him, what does he do before a show? Now, we're all consumers of, of alcohol. And we love the booze. And so we all sit there, and we're talking about, and this is his pregame. Does he pray, too? No, he doesn't pray. Here's what he goes. He goes, an hour before the gig, I have a Coors Light. About 50 minutes before the gig, I hit my first Jägermeister. What the hell is he doing? Finish the Coors Light, get another Coors Light going. Now there's a bunch of people around, so I'm throwing shots at everybody, and I'm taking shots with everybody in the room. The next Coors Light is down. I got a cold one. So I think he's up to, like, three Coors Lights and a shot of Jäger. Yeah, that sounds right-ish. It, yeah. might, it might be seven. Yeah. It, 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 it's a little fuzzy there. I'm throwing down with shots. I know how shots work, so continue. Yeah. Now it's about maybe 20 minutes before we go on. I have three or four more shots of Jaeger and three Coors Lights. They clear the room, and then we get about 15 minutes to ourselves. So then it's all of us, and I feel guilty because I'm the only one who's been doing shots of Jaeger. So I start feeding shots of Jaeger to the rest of the band who are all drinking white wine and champagne and whatever. So... As, I would hate to be I, in this I, band. I, I, I feel like this is made up. <laughs> I feel like this is a harking load of horse shit. You think that 50-year-old Dave Grohl is not taking – our count, I think they counted like 17 shots of Jaeger and like 10, I, 10, 10 Coors Lights. Every night, though, every single time well, that every he performs. Every time he goes on show. You only do like three or four shows a week. Still. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying. What do we think of that age, pregame? And, oh, in his age, he's in his advanced age. Every single show, come the fuck, bullshit. I, I like, I don't, buy, I don't buy. It. I think he's trying to sound cool. You think he's just? If trying he was to make trying sure to sound kids... cool, I would really pick something else besides Coors Light. I was about to say that same thing. Coors Light to me is like more or less. You might as well just drink a Gatorade. You have so well, much money. That is also money. true. You might as well just drink water with someone. Maybe that's how he's doing it. Like... Then that's why he's drinking Coors Light so he can have more of them and also be able to drink that many shots of Jaeger. Okay, so let me ask you: What would you say is an appropriate uh, accompaniment to Jaeger in terms of beer? Nothing. Alex? Just don't drink Jaeger. Okay. Or, uh, I think that's also a Coors great Light. answer. Uh, yeah, I think don't. Just don't drink Jaeger. Yeah, if you, and especially if you're going to have that much money, just, you know, treat like, yourself. I, I just want to put perspective. <laughs> like, if, if he really had that many shots. I, I I saw this once, and this is a thing that I saw at X-Fest. And this was the craziest things. I saw the Bloodhound Gang come out onto stage, which, remember them kids? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, they're still killing it, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. wow, they're so together They're still. performing, by the way, in that courtyard right now. Because <laughs> that. Yeah. Who hasn't performed in that courtyard? Yeah. I have once. <laughs> anyway, uh... I, so they get on stage, you're doing their crap. They're like, ah, who's burning the fuckers? But the fuckers burn. And then, you know, they're going to do their big song. And one of the guys comes up, you guys want to see me do a bong? And everyone's like, ah, yeah, show me the bong. He pulls out a beer bong. And everyone's like, he's going to do a beer bong. That's sweet. And it's like, no. Oh, no. And the guy pulls out a uh, bottle of Jägermeister, uh, fires the whole thing, fires it back. Drinks it. Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, woo. They do like two more songs that no one ever remembered. Yeah. And then they were right, they're right into like their la- what, the Sex with the Animals song, whatever it is. And you just watch the lead singer just trying to just go, Hoo! <laughs> <laughs> like the worst hot shit torn, <laughs> like so made terrible. the fucking exorcist look like fucking goddamn Thelma Louise. Like just the worst 
fucking it was black too i just imagine it's just oh a fire hose of just coming out of a man just ah forever Anyway, they stopped the show and they didn't finish the song. Uh, <laughs> I wonder what. And yeah. so Dave Grohl drank like half that yeah. every single night. Fuck off. Yeah, I don't believe it. Yeah, but I, my, here's my story about I was working a concert. Uh, it was uh, like the, a hip hop like kind of a festival, and the lead. The, this is how long ago it was. The two headliners were Public Enemy and Cypress Hill. Ooh. And actually, Black Eyed Peas opened, and this was pre Fergie in the yeah. band. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I get, and so I'm sitting there, and Cypress Hill was a is a big weed band, mm-hmm. and so uh, there's this kid who's like crowd surfing, and he's smoking on on, on, a, on a, a smoking a bowl, and he sits there, and he starts to try to hand it to the lead singer of Cypress Hill. So the lead singer of, singer of Cypress Hill tries to grab it. And he, when he pulls it away, he drops it on the stage, and literally the entire music stops. And everyone in the whole th- place just, oh, Cypress Hill dropped weed. How could this be? <laughs> and so he goes, all right, hold on. I'm going to get something. He li- walks off stage like he's, like, walking in the park. There's, now, by the way, there's 25,000 people at this place. They're all just, like, staring at Where the hell is he going? He comes back with a bag of, of, of weed, he pulls out like a big bushel full and he hands it to the kid. Oh my God. And he sits there and goes, Now I know what you're all saying. That was a nice pipe, and all I did was give him weed. Trust me, that weed I gave him was probably about five times more expensive than that pipe. Trust me, he's not going to remember this entire summer. <laughs> and then everyone goes, Wah! And then they go into insane in the brain. But like again, but on, on the other hand, I think I worked again concerts at, uh, in when I was in college. Most of the bands that I saw were very straight laced. Like Ozzy Osbourne actually showed up to the venue at seven a.m. to watch Load In. Like that's how committed he was to making sure that everything was done right. And everybody has this idea that Ozzy Osbourne was just the greatest, like you know, whatever drinker in the history of the world. Uh, Metallica was very, very kind of low key. Um, most of the bands were very, very. They had, most of them had families. I remember Rod Stewart was playing with his kids. When he was going out with Rachel Hunter at the time, he was playing with his kids most of the time. So again, I think you might be onto something that Dave Grohl was kind of trying to play to. That hey, I'm not such an old fogey type deal. I, I totally buy him drinking for the show. I get I, that's believable. Like yeah. if that's your ritual. They have pounding. What was the total? Do we? What was the total? Like, it got up to about. I think he was sitting there saying at least it's six or seven shots of Jaeger. But like, and then, but like, it sounded like what it really was. It sounded like it was more than that to me. Yeah, like I mean, it sounded like it was like it was like twelve drinks hard. before you started. Oh, twelve travel. drinks. Oh, yeah. Like, but that's like also like in an hour. Like an hour. Yeah, before. there was not and that much time. Then you gotta go off stage and you gotta do this right for like two yeah. hours. Yeah. Which makes sense because they said the last time he was in Pittsburgh, the show was two and a half hours. It took him two hours to get through ten songs. Because they said he just kept on talking. <laughs> he just kept on going, hey, everybody. And everyone's just like, play freaking Monkey Wrench. Speaking of Monkey Wrench, Lindsay Lohan is doing some crazy stuff, and I love it. Um, she has her own reality show, which when they described it, sounded terrible. Because the way to describe it on MTV, and by the way, that's still a thing, they um, – they sat there and they said, look on the behind the scenes on how a mogul runs one of the greatest clubs in all of Greece as Lindsay Lohan shows her business acumen. I'm like, that sounds terrible. I don't want to see it. Yeah. But recently, since I guess they're following her around now, she's doing more batshit crazy things. And have I you love watched it. the show? I haven't. Well, have you seen it? No. I, I don't no, think I'm it's out. I don't think it. they'll ever broadcast it. I think most of the stuff she's doing is illegal. Anyways. Well, one thing sounds definitely illegal from yeah. what I heard. Well, here's the other thing that this week she was doing an Instagram story. She's in Moscow, which again, who doesn't just go to Moscow just for fun? Oh, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's a great place. Anyways, so she sees a family outside. She tells the person to stop the car. She runs towards the family while doing an Instagram story and starts screaming in perfect Arabic. You, those children are being, uh, you're trafficking those children. 
How dare you traffic those children? By the way, she just ran out of the car. She did there's just a family walking down the streets and, and she speaks in perfect Arabic that she, these people are trafficking. And then so the family, knowing that this is Lindsay Lohan and, and Sanity Follows, slaps her across the face. What? And then there's the video of her crying, saying all I was trying to do was stop human trafficking. All I want to say is, if this is what the reality show is, I'm in. Yeah. I want this. I don't want someone showing me how she has great business acumen. No, I want craziness. This is what I want. So where did, what happened to that family? They just ran away. They just said, yeah, that's a and crazy person. And she just person. got back into her car. And, yeah, and, she, and but she's on an Instagram story. That show, I show, did I show you? The, did you put up the picture? No. Okay. There's a picture, like, and it has all the stories, like everyone's heart, 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 and all that kind yeah, of stuff yeah. on Instagram. And her crying because she's just like, oh, my God, I was trying. The thing is also, Lindsay Lohan, perfect Arabic? Just yeah, that's she crazy. does in her, her, her free time, you know? She's I like mean, a, she had a lot of free time, I, I feel. I think she's a spy. She might be like James Bond. Oh, wow, that would explain some things, but not all the rest. Yeah, <laughs> the, the perfect Arabic could explain. <laughs> the, uh, like, the, the thing that, like, what do, you, what do you think her, like, pre, I'm going to try to abduct these children's ritual was? Like, how many shots do you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like if you're in Russia, you're like, oh, I'd li- I, I, I would like some Jaeger, please. They're like, all right, great, here, and it's just give you vodka. Yeah, they don't even know it. it. They'll be like, hey, can I have a glass of water? It's just vodka. Yeah, it's just vodka. Yeah, soda, vodka, everything vodka. Like, hey, can I have a burger? It's just vodka. It's just a bomb. The, the whole country is based off potato-based alcoholic beverages. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which is, is why, as long, as long just, as you have a why deal. it's a great place. Yeah. Which is why, if you ever Google a term and meantime in Russia, you just see from dash cams just the craziest stuff in the history of the world. Okay. Like planes crashing into like schools and they're not canceling school. Like yeah, very small of. vehicles that must be ran off vehicles that are just filled with timber or like Persian rugs for no reason. Yeah. But... Speaking of Persian rugs, um, I want this job. In Japan, parents are paying really burly men to pretend to be their kid's uncle so that if the kid is getting bullied, they they go up to the kids and speak sternly to the to the parent to the people that are bullying their kids and the and the uncle, which they call it, they call it mean uncle. The person plays mean uncle, they get 400 bucks a day. I think I just want to hire that man just to have a nice looking burly man. Just a know? nice burly man? Yeah. But I think I could do that job. If, hey, if you're out there and you think your kid is getting bullied, pay me 400 bucks a day. I'll pretend to be the kid's uncle and I'll scream at some kid. $400 for... is a really good price. Yeah, that's yeah. a fuck ton of money, though. I would never pay that as a parent. Well, maybe it's like only a day service, though. Like, it's okay, no, like, like okay, one what if you day, get you five get families. I mean, there's tons of like the, the, the bullied kids for five. You could get at least three. I also, five days. I, mean, I assume this is a service you give to rich kids. Oh yeah, this isn't like something that the government's doing to like kids and. I know, also neighbors. feel like if I was one of those burly men, then I would talk to the children that were bullying and make them bully more kids so that I could make more money. Doing that's it. That's brilliant. Oh my god. Boom. Like that's get a bunch why. of kids in the system that start being shitty kids and then you put your like you create the supply and the demand. Yeah. Oh damn girl. Uh, we got a business plan. <laughs> Alex, that was brilliant. Because honestly, like if I did this, I'd be like, okay, here's the deal. This kid is off limits. But that kid looks like he's susceptible. Go yeah. talk to him. Yeah, he is or a lot of money. Or I would like find the ten richest families in the school and then essentially get those kids to get bullied because, and then offer my services. Let's to go those in Fortune Five Hundred. Let's see top ten richest families in this yeah. high school. <laughs> yeah. That's a brilliant business model. So I'm a, I'm appreciative of that. Now here is a terrible business model and a candidate for scumbag of the year, Paul Anthony uh, Manchella in Arizona. Um, pretended to have Down syndrome. So I don't know what the next of this story is, but fuck this son of a <laughs> he pre- Oh my God, I hope they die. Yeah. Please help this. He pretended continue. to have Down syndrome so that caregivers would go to his house and bathe him and like clean up his, like, and he had wore diapers because it was a weird sexual fantasy for him. I feel like you could just pay I, someone to do that. I, I work with like you can pay people to do that. Yeah. But he wanted it for free because listen, I my 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 part time day gig is I work with special needs people. Mm-hmm. And anyone who does that is like two Lindsay Lohans. Yes, like that is that is, you are an awful piece of crap. Scumbag like, of the year. Like I I I, I mean, 
Oh my god, I cannot. I like that is the most revolting. Where does that go? Where does I mean again? Like I understand being a complete scumbag. I understand scumbag behavior to a point. But where do you get the thought that hey, not like you said, you just go on Craigslist and say hey, does anybody want to? I have a fetish that I want to be a baby and you know yeah. I want to change my diaper, whatever like that, and spank me, whatever. You can pay prostitutes to do that. That's why they exist. That's why they're low flying angels. But to pretend to be a special needs, to pretend to have Down syndrome so that someone will change you because you get off sexually. And the way he found out, which was insane, is some, like one of the caregivers was like, this is really weird that you're just asking me to like shower you constantly. So the woman followed, like the, the apparently like he got on a bus and he went and he and went to the house. He went to the house. The parents were in the house. Surprisingly, at 31, he still lived with his parents. And he sat there and knocked on the door. I'm like, yeah, can, does your son have special needs? And the kid's like, no. That's how the, that's how the parents found out that their kid was that level of scumbag. Like, how, like, well, what level do you need that much kind of attention? And, like, you have that sick, like, that harsh. But, but like, the point Alex makes is, like, the perfect one. It's like, if you really wanted someone to do that for you, you could probably just pay somebody rather than, like, abusing, like, other, like, other people's like funding like, yes that funding's like super tight like states aren't like all about helping those people i don't know if you know that yeah america the- i don't know if you notice but uh special needs services are severely underfunded this is your psa for some fat guy who just swore about this guy uh <laughs> no, no he's a complete scumbag and deserves to die he, he deserve. he should be executed as far as I'm concerned. I feel like someone could also do this for free. There's some weird people on Craigslist. I've looked right? at a lot of them, and I feel like people could do this for free. Why not a lady will do it for you? Or yeah. a dude, or a dog. I don't yeah. give a shit. Yeah. Or a dude in a robot mask. So, I don't fuck whatever. There's people just as weird as you, man. There you go. That's what, Honestly, if that's what this show is yeah. about. There are people just as weird as you. And it's like, yeah, it's just that he just didn't put any effort. Yes. That's the, yeah. that's the most bothersome part. It's just yeah. like, eh, ah, we'll just... Let the government do it. Yeah, like. absolutely. Speaking of the government, this is a teacher that I do not understand how this person got any lo- – like we had a segment called Teacher of Merit, and we don't have it anymore, but this teacher would probably be Teacher of Merit. Um, it is Jared Hensley, who's an athletic director from uh, Tennessee. Oh, because you, you only the finest people are athletic directors. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a tough job to get. That's the sweet the, – the athletic director at certain high schools in western Pennsylvania make well into six figures. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's the cushiest job I know what ours was like, and oh, my God. That, that guy has spent 90% of his day sitting on his fat ass in his office. Hey, I'm not going to lie. It seemed like a pretty sweet job. Yeah, it's, it's a great gig if you can get it. Well, this guy isn't going to get it anymore because he was like – he had like on the morning – announcements he had like he was like standing like he was the president of the united states and he was like behind was like the school logo and everything like that and so apparently the um there's a dress code where you couldn't wear quote unquote athletic shorts you could wear like cargo shorts and stuff like that but you couldn't wear athletic shorts to school so here is him uh talking about the ban on athletic shorts at the high school says while addressing the dress code policy regarding athletic shorts Hensley said, if you really want to blame someone, blame the girls. Uh, I knew because that was they it. pretty much, this is the line, they pretty much ruin everything. They ruin the dress code. They ruin, well, ask Adam. Look at Eve. That's all you really need to do. Uh, you really need to go back to the beginning of time. So it'll be like that for the rest of your life. Get used to it. Keep your mouth shut. Suck it up and follow the rules. Like, I really wish I could go back and, like, a bunch of situ- serious situations where, like I could cite like books of fiction to like get me out of problems. Yes. I'd be like, I don't know, all old ladies are clearly bitches. Have you not read Great Expectations? <laughs> yes. Like that lady caught her Miss Habersham caught herself on fire. And that means old ladies are like Ah Well like and then recently with the uh Judge the Judge Kavanaugh thing, there was actually a woman that quoted the Bible which is why she said you shouldn't believe women who claim sexual assault because there's a story in the Bible of a woman not of, of lying about sexual assault. So you can't believe all women because in a story in the Bible. There's also a dude who built a giant yacht yes. for animals. Yes. <laughs> like, fuck off. The dude got turned into a pillar of salt and no one immediately started a business and sold that shit. No. Bullshit. There was a guy who walked through an ocean. Yeah. He, spl- he parted an ocean and walked an entire race of people through the ocean. 
and then yeah. decided afterwards because they had a they had a party for a weekend that like nope you don't deserve to die we're just gonna walk around the desert for 40 yeah. years yeah for 40 years in a desert that's like the size of Jersey yeah like uh, that's impossible eventually they walked back to Egypt yeah that's, eventually they just want to walk back and be like what are you guys doing here well to be fair it's the only place that's probably lit up so they're like well let's Let's just go that way. I just want to know who put this guy on their morning announcements and, like, what he said he was going to talk about for you, this. And yeah, they were like, a, yeah, that's cool, that's cool. Yeah, that. almost that. gets to the point to where, like, I watched the morning announcement, and you could tell that he was trying to somewhat be humorous, which goes back to, as a comedian, I, this is a PSA for every person, leave comedy to the professionals. This person was trying to be, but again, it's such a sexist like thing to sit there and say, well, if you want to blame anybody, blame the girls. And I'm just like, you know what? How do you have a job at anything? Not even as an athletic director. I'm talking about a job. I'm talking about the, you should not like clean up that guy's vomit on the stage that freaking Derek saw. You're, you're yeah. underqualified for that position, let alone as an athletic director. And he position. still has a job, right? Well, he probably got to leave and he has to take like a course where he goes like, don't blame women for everything. <laughs> and he has to be like, okay. And then he gets his job back. Well, it depends how they, the football team probably did last season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Team, yeah if the true. football team would, yeah, depends. <laughs> he has like, okay, if the team was 10 and 0. Then they're like, yeah. okay, take an afternoon off. And like some dude just went to like, you know, Ohio State or something, and it's like starting D. Or they're like, oh, okay, well he he did that somehow. Yeah. yeah. So. But if it was under five wins, then yeah, they probably got rid of him, and that was how they found it. So yeah. again, that is news and notes from the world of sports gossip and weirdness. And now our final segment, Alex, it's which it's called comment your ass off. Where if anyone commented on the Facebook live feed, we comment away. Play the theme song. See you later. We just have a few comments okay. today. Right. Lots of emojis. Our favorite fan, Sam. All righty. Um, he asked if that's Walmart water on your desk. You can't tell him because that's paying advertising. Okay. Don't tell him. Don't is tell it him. though? Is it what? Is it though? What? It's is that it Walmart is a, water? It is a great value, this water though. It is. Mm. Yeah. It, it's the type of water that you would get at a place where they build walls. Sam, look into my eyes. That was definitely good for yeah, I believe uh, so. audio. Honestly. By the way, Sam, <laughs> if Sam isn't aroused right now, you're legally dead. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, asked if he, I think he asked this question last year. Do you have special guests lined up for Sweeps Weeks? And Derek I, freaking Mento. Yeah, I, learned, I learned what Sweeps Weeks was. I already forgot, but I yeah. learned then. It's where they do advertising, where they. Oh like, right, do, right. Yeah, yeah, and that's why we brought Derek Minto yeah, in yeah. Yeah. for like the sex, for guess. the sex symbol. Yeah, we bring the sex. Yeah, mm -hmm. about, we bring the we bring the of, of hot sex tips. Yeah, that's we bring this. I mean. We bring the People heat. People look at me and they're like, "Damn, I want my bitch jumbled by that, sir." Mm, bitch jumbled, jumbled by that, sir. Bits jumbled. Yeah, bitch jumbled. I, I thought like you said that. bitch jumbled. Yeah, like jumbling their bits. Yeah, yeah. And doing the giving some bodies. Smashing and bodies. Yeah, yeah. You know? By the way, Alex, I want the next time you're with a gentleman to sit there and be like, smash my bits. And but I want you to say it like you're like a like a nineteen thirties waitress in the South. All right, we'll see like, how it goes. Like I want you to smash my bits. Okay. There you go. I'll remember that. Uh do you want to know the score of the Denver, Kansas City game? Sure, what's up? Uh thirteen ten halftime, Denver. Okay. Ooh, Denver's up on Kansas oh, City. Gosh. There you go. That'll work well tomorrow when this is broadcast on Tuesday. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. People are gonna care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get a sports score from yesterday. <laughs> If Last I was in a night. pool, like like in the Super Bowl, like I had three and ten, I had three <laughs> and zero. Checking in for lottery numbers from yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, do you plan to broadcast a Halloween show? Are you going to dress up on this year's Halloween show? Did we do that? No. Did we have we ever done that? No, I don't like. It. I can't remember we Halloween. Both hate, we both hate Halloween. <laughs> we don't have a Halloween both show. Dress as each other. That would be fun. Uh, we I feel like we already wear the same things typically. Yeah, we just, we're typically no, wearing no, a black t-shirt. He's got t -shirt. a cardigan. He's got a black shirt. Oh yeah, card. yeah. You but typically I wear a black t-shirt. Okay, yeah. Do yeah. you want to wear a cardigan and sure. like a low cut shirt? Sure. I'm sure people will really really love the chest hair. Yeah. 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 It'll it's, be the, yeah. It'll be the same type of people that watch our show for your for, for <laughs> low plunging thing. Like oh now Sasson's giving me the cleavage. Hell there yeah. You go. Hell yes. Uh, that was it. Okay, thank you very much to Derek Minto. Again, this Saturday, starting up the Burning Bridges Comedy uh, Club. Club at Hambones. 
I was like, it's festival. There's so many different it's, things. It's okay, man. There's it's so many different things yeah. that uh, John has done. So it's a great thing there. Again, thank you for Derek. Get the tickets at the show or online. Uh, also, again, this Saturday, the La Creme Comedy, uh, the La Creme Festival in Allentown. Go see some great music there starting up at 1 o'clock and the rockin' ends when the rockin' stops. Rain or shine. So, again, in Pittsburgh, that's important. And, again, if you want to, go to the Pittsburgh Libation Festival. Get five bucks off your ticket when you just put in Sasson, S-A-S-S-O-N. You get five bucks off to get all of the great stuff. That is October 12th at Nova Place. Again, thank you very much to Derek Minto. Thank you very much to the greatest producer in the history of Internet Radio, Alex Clemens. My name is Mike Sasson. You're listening to The River's Edge at www.riversedgepgh.com. We'll be back next week. Some more wild, wonderful stuff, and hopefully someone will play with my bits. See you guys later. Bye! Bye.